Greetings! You've reached the Signal Watch Halloween series. Join me and my creepy cadre of co-contributors as we examine artifacts from the catacombs, boldly explore creeping horrors, and try to put it all in perspective. Stay tuned, we're gonna try to make this spooky. Final time for Halloween. <laughs> Ooh, yes. Hello, hello. Happy Halloween. Yeah, this is going to be our final podcast for Halloween for 2019. This is. Well, yeah, we're we're literally about two weeks away from Halloween, so I think we've run out of time. <laughs> we did, we did, and honestly, we've given you guys more Halloween movies than uh, you could ever possibly watch or uh, would be interested in probably watching. So thanks for sticking with us as we have made our way through the Halloween season. Uh, I'm Ryan Steens, uh, your host here at the Signal Watch, and with me as often... Simon Day, again. Um, a lovely horror double bill. And by the way, we did have lots of ideas for Halloween. We're going to try... We were talking about trying to do some of those through the year, spread out, because mm-hmm. um, we had some great ideas for double bills. Uh, but today's double bill is, um, I guess, a weather-related right. double bill. <laughs> when the when the barometer drops, <laughs> things get spooky. Yeah, we got John Carpenter's The Fog from 1980, and we have The Mist from 2007, directed by Frank Darabont. And uh, we just finished what we literally just finished watching The Mist, which you hadn't seen before. I've never seen it before. And I was trying to think of other links apart from obviously the weather. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking probably Lovecraft. Very Lovecrafty in both of them. Mm-hmm. But yeah, but I mean, uh, what did you think? Because you kind of, I mean, we can start with The Fog if you like. Sure. So you, you've seen The Fog a couple of times? Maybe? I saw it my second time when I watched it. Uh, about I watched it <laughs> the first time on your suggestion and Stuart's suggestion when I yeah. was in a motel room in Bozeman, Montana for a week of conferences. And oh, I right. stayed uh, after to drive around Montana, but in the evening you don't want to be driving, you know, in the wilds of Montana. Yeah. Uh, so I'd come back, you know, at dark, eat dinner, and then I sat and watched The Fog in my motel room. I really like The Fog. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I like both of these movies. I just want to start yeah. there. So if you think I'm going to be very different, down on it, very different. Very different. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't uh, get into how I didn't know how different they were going to be when we get to The Mist. And yeah, so I, I so the fog starts with John Houseman telling this kind of ghost story himself. So he's to, setting to quote, you up to quote Bill Murray and Scrooge, America's favorite old fart, reading a book. <laughs> 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 but yeah, it, it sets it up as this like classic ghost story. So I think it's a yeah. great movie for Halloween. Totally, um, perfect totally. for for this for the season. Had they actually set it at Halloween, even better. It's not. It's in the middle of April, yeah. but. Um, yeah, we have something that happened in the past, and, and years ago. yeah, and, and what could that have to do with what's happening to our characters now? Yeah, I mean the fog. I I love the fog. The fog to me is comfort food because I saw this when I was young in England. It was um, weirdly on just before Christmas, about three years running. So about three days before Christmas, the BBC kept sticking it on. So I always kind of think of it as a Christmas movie in a in a weird way. Um, but it's, you know, I like how, like you say, it's an old-fashioned ghost story, but contemporized, at least mm-hmm. to when it came out in 1980. Yeah. Um, and I like how, you know, John Carpenter himself said he got the idea because he, he traveled to England to promote Assault on Precinct 13. And him and Deborah Hill, who were going out at the time or married at the time, uh, went to Stonehenge. And there was a big fog, kind of like on the fields around Stonehenge. And John Carpenter was just like, we well, you know what would happen if there was something in the fog, mm-hmm. and um, and that kind of led to him, you know, obviously thinking about it. 
There was also a book called The Fog, though, by James Herbert from the mid-70s, late-70s. James Herbert was our kind of British Stephen King. Mm -hmm. He um, he wrote a lot of horror novels, especially 70s and 80s and 90s. Um, I think he's... I think he's still going just about. Um, but he, he kind of wrote loads of stuff. And a few of them have been made into films. He hasn't had much luck than being made into films. His book of the fog is totally different. I think in that some kind of gas escapes from the earth and makes everybody kind of go insane. Oh. Who comes across it and they all start, you know, attacking each other. Okay. Um, so it's a little bit more like the crazies, mm-hmm. I guess, as a concept. Um but I've always loved The Fog, you know. And it's interesting, the background of this, because Carpenter kind of made it. He had a deal with um, Avco Embassy for two films. I think this and Escape from New York. And this was first. So he made it, watched it, and he went, oh, my God, it doesn't work. It it doesn't hold together. It's not scary. So he went back um, and reshot a third of it. Oh, wow. And added in gore. A lot more gore. Which is funny because when you watch it, I don't think there is a lot of gore. I don't think of it as having any gore. Um, I think it's all sound effects, actually. Because if you think about... And spoilers, obviously, here for the entire podcast. But when you think about when he gets a victim like Dan the Weatherman or uh, the old lady babysitting, yeah. you hear these squelches uh-huh. and lots of kind of metal clangs of hooks and swords. But you don't really see anything. Yeah, um, I, I think it's the perfect amount in a lot of ways of, of what's in there. It's enough to make it not feel like you're watching like a, um, you know, Are You Afraid of the Dark Slasher, episode yeah. on Nickelodeon. Uh, so it's not like for kids, but it, yeah. it's enough to kind of make it, okay, I'm 13, I'm watching this, but I'm not going to, yeah. you know, watch it between my fingers, you know, sort of thing. Well, it's a lot of kind of like um, insinuation mm-hmm. and it leaves a lot to the imagination. Like I love the bit in the morgue where the guy kind of gets up mm-hmm. and, you know, while they're talking, the two other guys, you know, Tom Atkins, and um, the guy from Assault and Precinct 13, I think Dwayne Johnson, who plays Dr. Fibes. There's a lot of joke names in The Fog, by oh, the way. Oh, right, 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 right. Um, but there's, they're saying, hey, it's suddenly got cold in here while they're outside. Yeah. And, of course, Jamie Lee Curtis got it back to the, the morgue table and this kind of zombie is slowly getting up. So he kind of plays around with a lot of kind of, um, like you say, kind of like fright Halloween-y stuff. Um, but it's not too in your face. Um, so weirdly, yeah, John Carpenter did go back and shoot, reshoot stuff. I think he also put music on it, and he said, "Dang God, it worked!" But it's the closest my career came in the early days to to failing, um, and it was a big hit. It, it cost a million to make, roughly, and I think um, I think it made. Said he turning his paper quickly. I think it made about twenty million. Holy cow! Yeah, um, so it did very well. Um, and it's had a pretty full life on rental. I think it, it, like we were talking about this the other time I saw you, I think it picked up a bit of steam and a bit more cred when the remake came out, which was so bad <laughs> that in 2005, people were like, actually, John Carpenter's was very good. They kind of suddenly went, actually, you know, yeah. looking back compared to this. <laughs> Doing John a favor. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's got a great cast. Uh both of these movies do if yeah. we're going to compare and contrast um, should we talk about the fog cast a little yeah please we got uh, well we, you mentioned um, John Hoosman um, who only has a little cameo at the start yeah he never it? appears again I don't think no it's almost like the mum of the boy so the boy is there who will play a role in the story and it's funny because like Adrian Babo plays his mum and later on she goes like is that a that old Mr. Me can be telling you ghost stories again on the beach or something. <laughs> some guy freaks out the kids every Friday or something on the beach around a campfire. Uh, but Adrian Barbeau's in there who'd actually just married John Carpenter. So there's a weird onset atmosphere because he'd previously been married to Deborah Hill, who was the producer. And they kind of said, actually, there was a bit of ill feeling from the crew until I think they sat everybody down and said, you know, well, we're cool about this. We're adults, you know. Huh. Um... Jamie Lee Curtis, of course, uh, coming back in a bit of a thankless role, to be honest, as a kind of sexy hitchhiker. She doesn't really do much, to be honest. Um, and I used to have the soundtrack CD of this, the 2000 uh, version, where there's actually a kind of hilarious interview with Jamie Lee Curtis from 1980, just before this came out. And she sounds really, you know, really young, obviously, because she was 20. And she's like, 
I don't want to be typecast as a scream queen. I can see lots of different facets in this role. And you're like, you're kidding yourself, Jen. <laughs> you're 20 years old. You don't know what you're talking about. Um, Janet Lee, uh, her real life mum, mm-hmm. isn't it? Obviously psycho, you know. Tom Atkins, uh, great role for Tom Atkins. Uh, hero role. He doesn't often get the chance, but he's great in this. Um, and I think one of my favourites, Hal Holbrook as the drunken Father Malone, who has some great unintentional, intentional, hilarious moments. I think when he leaps out of the dark and grabs Janet Lee's shoulder yeah. in the church, it's brilliant. <laughs> yeah. Every time they go and see him, he's waving a bottle around. Well, we're cursed, we're cursed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, the, the character uh, is interesting. I mean, the it, he's I'm, I don't think it's the first time you're going to see a drunk priest on screen, but... Um, mm. It, I couldn't quite figure Zulu, out what they were, Zulu. What, what, they were <laughs> what they were saying of like what's oh, this lineage of priests I'm like are you Catholic because if you Definitely are Irish <laughs> um, so I was, I was a little confused as to what was going on there uh, my, my, my guess was they were not supposed to be Catholic but they, they never quite cleared that up it was because I kept saying the priest and we don't in, I don't know. I grew up Lutheran. We didn't call our pastor a priest. I mean, what is his... His church wasn't necessarily Catholic. I guess he had, like, some some ornaments in there, I guess. But, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Um, kind of makes a match, wasn't it? Yeah. And, it, you know, 100 years ago isn't really that long ago. Um, so, saying, you know, it was a bunch of Methodists or somebody who rolled into this town and set it up is not exactly the craziest thing in the world. Well, let's talk about that a little bit because the plot revolves around. So it's a hundred years celebration mm-hmm. is coming up. Janet Lee's organising it. You know, mm-hmm. she's very excited about it, and, um, and you know, and everybody else is kind of going on with their everyday lives. And then the night before, so I've got, so I've got three. I don't know if this is the time to get these out, unpack these, but I've got three plot holes. Go for it. This okay. The first one, I guess, is the biggest, which I noticed when I was a kid which I think makes it the most obvious because I, I noticed it when I was a kid. They originally, this, you know, Blake and his crew were trying to found a leper colony mm-hmm. and they were going to give gold to this settlement to allow them to like build it a couple mm-hmm. of miles up the road mm-hmm. or a mile up the road. <clears throat> and instead, you know, the founders of the settlement, the father and the, the founding fathers and the priest purposely set up a false lighthouse um, so they they ran their ship onto the rocks, sank and died. Mm-hmm. And then they retrieved the gold and built the settlements on it. And now, of course, 100 years later, we're celebrating, you know, the settlement. So the ghosts, obviously quite pissed off, are coming back mm-hmm. um, to get their gold. Um, now, all through the film, it keeps going, you know, six must die. Mm-hmm. You know, six based on the original conspirators. But I feel like... These aren't necessarily the ancestors of the six conspirators. I feel like these tend to be anybody they run across. So this time when I was watching it, I really noticed that. Yeah. Uh, mostly in trying to figure out why they're going after Adrienne Barbeau. Yeah, because she's, she's, she says at the start, I'm not from here. Yeah. I've just moved here. Yeah, and they're chasing her up the lighthouse at the end. Well, also I was thinking, and this kind of leads into my second problem with this it comes the fog actually appears over two nights Mm -hmm. so it comes the first night it comes at midnight it comes at midnight oh on the same day you mean yeah so it's all within one day i see what you mean actually that makes it a bit better that doesn't make it a bit better but i was thinking if it came that first night and obviously the first thing it runs across is the three guys on the seagrass Mm -hmm. takes them out rolls into shore up to a nick's Mm -hmm. kind of house on the beach Nearly gets him, but luckily it strikes one o'clock before he gets a chance to open the door. Cause it takes him so long to put his trousers on. He's very tight jeans. It takes too long, <laughs> luckily for him. Um, but I'm thinking if it had happened to run across a couple of tramps, we'd have gone, we got our six, cheers, bye, <laughs> and just disappear. Because I'm like, surely it would want to go after the people, the, you know, the ancestors of the people who did the crime, rather than some weatherman yeah. answering the door or an old lady babysitting. I mean, I think the old lady babysitting was supposed to be the ancestor of one of the people. Mm. Um, I don't think it was super clear, but there was something how Holbrook says at the very end of the film. Mm. It almost felt to me like, oh, man, we better 
But he also says, why didn't they take me? Yeah, because they got five at that point. Yeah. Um, and he knows just... He, he knows... Because that's when he's he's going through the list. He's like, they got what's-her-name, who's you know the babysitter, who's <coughs> part of this. This is Cobridge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and they got the guys on the Dan, boat, Dan I guess. Dan the Weatherman. Dan the... Okay, yeah, I don't know if Dan the Weatherman was supposed to be... I mean, I doubt he's been living there his yeah. entire life, his entire family. Whether the, the three fishing guys may be... But again, a bit of a stretch that mm-hmm. all three of their ancestors were mm-hmm. part of this plot. Um, so I feel like that doesn't really hold together. Um, which leads me on to my final question. You kind of helped out with the, the, you know, all happening in one day thing. But again, you know, like I say, even with that, I feel like the first night it kind of turns up, does kill the guys on the seagrass, mm-hmm. but then just messes with the electrics and goes away again. Yeah. <laughs> and then the second night's like, right, now, now we're going to do this properly. <laughs> And everybody, so, you know, the main cast obviously rush up to the church because it's the only place up on the hill that mm-hmm. the fog hasn't permeated. Hasn't it had a chance to kill anybody in the town down below? Has it swept through the town? Is, right. So, <laughs> I mean, yeah, she's freaking out on the radio, like yelling at everyone to get safe, to do this, to do that. Which you know. the main cast do. Right, oh, five of them. But we don't know what's happened with all the people who are having, you know, out, out on the town. All the people because the, it's the festival. Yeah, the celebration. Yeah. Where did they all go? Yeah, I um, feel like they left some. I mean, I didn't notice it the first time I watched it, but this time when I watched it, I definitely noticed it had this big kind of like you feel. It felt like they left out like a whole thirty minutes of the movie of dealing yeah. with what was going on in the town with these ghosts, and they could have done it and not had anybody actually get killed. Yeah, yeah. Just having ghosts kind of you know cause havoc. Yeah. Um, I do wonder also the, the <laughs> budgetary reasons. The, yeah. yeah, the pirates, pirate ghosts. Well, they look like pirates. One, they're supposed yeah. to be lepers, and they all look like for some reason they have hooks and cutlasses. And yeah, they all look like they're from like <laughs> about you know thirty, forty, fifty years before when they're supposed to be. Like, yeah. in, in, I mean, there may have still been mast ships going around. I guess in the eighteen eighties, yeah. but by the eighteen eighties, you're starting to get into like steamers and stuff. So, yeah. Um, well, this it was definitely a, a like they could have said it 200 years in the past and said it in Maine or something and solved all of these problems but they're like no we're going to film this in California for some reason <laughs> so it's got we're going to make sure that it can only, then it can only be the passengers which is silly too because California was being settled yeah you know well well in advance of that so I mean I do like how he kind of does a Pirates of the Caribbean years before the uh-huh. Pirates of the Caribbean but like an R-rated version yeah I do love how the fisher the fishermen come out and go you know what's that and then this huge you know kind of like ship is mm-hmm. next to them you know this kind of yeah. like big sailing ship you know all torn up and you know mm-hmm. rushing and I think you know that's, that's very you know very atmospheric indeed and I love how you know Andy I guess Adrian Bobo's son finds the Elizabeth Dane name mm-hmm. the Driftwood on the beach and then you know and then that kind of like is you know comes to life and is cursed and six must die or whatever it's an albatross my god <laughs> not a millstone um, and that's great um, but my th- okay my third point um, is the gold right yeah uh-huh. so we, we know the, we know the original idea which was to retrieve the gold uh-huh. to help build the the settlement right at the end though Hal Holbrook is reading his grandfather's diary and he's like basically his grandfather's going none of the other conspirators knew that I actually took the gold and hid it in the last place they'd look so he took the gold somehow the next day without anybody seeing <laughs> but stay with me um, hid it in the, well melted it down into a cross for yeah. some reason that he can never display <laughs> ever and hid it in the wall of his church. So how did they build the settlement and expand it if they never had the gold? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. Plus, why did he bother turning it into a cross when he can never show anybody that? Or use it? I could make, <laughs> I could make up reasons, maybe, but I, I mean, it's because not... Because it looks good. cool at the end when Blake grabs it off Hal Holbrook. Yeah. That's why, basically. Yeah, um, and they could have easily written a line that was like, well, this was my portion of the gold and I used yeah, it to yeah. to make this. And thing. I felt so bad about it. I just mm-hmm. turned into a cross to, to, to like, for the, you know, the, the greatness of God mm-hmm. or something. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, and then they could have had the cross out, you know, as anyway. It was, it was, yeah. um, 
So it's kind of like I was like, <laughs> well, hang on, they never they never ended up with the gold. Yeah. So what's the problem, really? Or, or if you felt that bad, why didn't you just leave it where it was and none of this would have happened? <laughs> you could have thrown the cross back in years later. <laughs> uh, it's, it's got some plot holes, for sure. Yeah. Um, it, but, it can be a little confusing. But I still think it's a very entertaining movie. Yeah, I will say none of that affects the enjoyment mm-hmm. I get from watching it. And I, I was lucky enough to... I think you were away, but I was lucky enough to see it at the AFS theatre mm-hmm. uh, two, three weeks ago. Uh, um, with a you know with an audience on a big screen and um, and it was great watching it with a crowd because it kind of it still really worked um, and you know and the ending's great you know it's got that little shock ending um, yeah it kind of holds together very well I think yeah I, I it, as far as like it, it sometimes it feels like when they're trying to make a ghost story it feels like a lot of it's kind of 13 ghosts you know that sort of thing um you know i like that stuff i like the haunted house but i also think there's the difference between a ghost story scooby-doo yeah um and i i wish that i could find a little bit more stuff like this if you know of more stuff like this send it my way um maybe something to look at you know so (coughs) further down the line as we're looking for horror movies but we tends to be most ghost stories i think tend to be either the house is haunted by spirit or you know some some area is haunted is haunted by one particular spirit for a reason normally they were done away with Mm -hmm. and it's you know it's very english and very down the line um and, you know, just the idea of this, I thought was interesting. Yeah. You know, I liked, I liked how they came back. I liked how, you know, a bit like we said about American Wolf, it was like real people having to deal with a supernatural thing thrusting mm-hmm. in their face. Yeah. yeah. The storyline uh, or timeline of the story, rather, is really brief. Um, mm. It, Like we said, it takes place over like 36 hours or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. pretty fast just long enough for you to kind of get a taste of who the characters are but it doesn't feel like just long enough for Tom Atkins to get laid right <laughs> <laughs> always pick up hitchhikers folks it always works out I miss the 80s where not particularly attractive 45 year old men could pick up 20 year old girls gorgeous 20 year old girls <laughs> <laughs> never happens to you you just gotta start driving around picking up hitchhikers man um <laughs> but, uh the Sigma Watch podcast is not endorsed. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> hey, Tom Atkins can get away with it. That's, right, that's right. Nice. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's funny because this is the third Tom Atkins movie I've seen in this week. Because I watched Creep yeah, Show, The yeah. Fog, and um, Night of the Creeps the well, other night. Why are you always talking about Tom Atkins, Ryan? <laughs> <laughs> so we, we had this moment when Jamie and I were watching uh, Fog and. Jamie doesn't know who Tom Atkins is from, you know, Adam. And she, she turns around and looks at me and goes, this guy seems like someone, a guy like you and Simon would really like. Yep. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> it's like, and Stuart really likes him too. Yeah. We all love him. He's great. He's kind of a thing. He's pockmarked greatness. She just kind of shook her head sadly. Um, well, this was, I mean, what I like about Tom Atkins is he... He really kind of like... I think he kind of... It's because he anchors the reality of it. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because even when things, you know, start getting kind of weird and supernatural, you know, it's almost like he's more pissed off than scared. It's like, he's just like, oh my God, I didn't expect this today. I just want to get drunk or something. (laughs) (laughs) It's true. It's true. He definitely has a... um, Every man kind of... Yeah. Yeah, which is why he worked in those other two movies so well. Um, yeah, and Halloween three. I'll give a shout out to Halloween three if you haven't seen it. He's a, he, he's a great man as well as the hero. Um, so I mentioned Lovecraft. Though I was thinking, there's an Edgar Allan Poe quote at the start though. Mm-hmm. Um, is which all, <laughs> it's all we see and all we seem but a dream within a dream. Yeah, yeah. It's that inevitable bit of pretension, right? It's like <laughs> we're gonna do this, and then we're gonna go into the ghost story. It's like keep heeping it on, Skip Carpenter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, so yes, there is the Edgar Allan Poe quote, and also I think Carpenter called a lot of the the geographical points in this after Lovecraftian names. Oh, so it's like uh, I think Watley Point, um, and Arkham Reef. 
I think. Oh, okay. The old from Lovecraft, I think. Arkham so. certainly is. Yeah. 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 The honestly, the only Ark, uh, Arkham I've ever read, the only um, Lovecraft Batman. I ever read was uh, <laughs> in the Mountains of Madness. Mm. I think was the wherever there's giant penguins. That's that's the one I read, <laughs> which I love. <laughs> terrifying giant penguin <laughs> this sounds brilliant <laughs> um, yeah but no I mean I totally recommend this so we need to watch the remake I feel because I've, I've heard so many bad things about it well I'd, I'd love to because it <coughs> stars uh, Tom Welling who I watched for several seasons of the Small Deville TV show as Clark Kent yeah uh, and he was did, never he... the strongest actor yeah. uh, <laughs> so I'm very curious to see how he is uh, trying to hold his own in a feature film I heard they squeezed it in around the fourth season the remake of The Fog um, I don't know much about it except Maggie Grace is in it and Selma Blair Selma Blair oh, Selma Blair okay. is yeah Selma Blair is basically doing the um, Adrian Barbo kind of like you know um, husky voice DJ thing I can see that um, I've heard they change it up so they they change up and actually do try to solve the ancestor thing so they are all related in that mm. one um but then I've also heard the CGI is absolutely horrible. And it's like, why did you use CGI when John Carpenter got away with that with fog machines? So much better. Right. So, I mean, we, we talked at the beginning of this a, a bit about, you know, they don't show all that much. And, and um, I think both this movie and The Mist, The Mist has a much higher budget, which they spent on actors. Let's be real honest. Mm-hmm. Um, but this movie gets away with a lot because it, it it is in your mind. It's kind of yeah. trying to guess, you know, you can kind of see these silhouettes. Had they shown the ghosts up close, mm. which they do once or twice, yeah. um, but they don't spend, they don't linger on it. It's not, it's, it's kind of the problem I have with Jurassic Park versus Jurassic World, where Jurassic Park, mm. half of it is, oh crap, what's behind that tree? You know, things yeah. popping out at you, whatnot. You never really get a good look. It's, it's, yeah. um, and because two. these are predators, they're going to jump out at you, right? Yeah. Um, in versus Jurassic World, which is like, let's pull out to this wide and shot and to look at how much we can show of all these pterodactyls flying around. And uh, yeah. well, it even goes back to the you know, less is more, just yeah. like in horror in general, mm-hmm. because you know, all your imagination comes up with is always going to be worse than yeah. what, you, what you're shown. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to use this as our chance to pivot over to the mist, then. Yeah, totally, totally. Um, so yeah, so I'd, I'm very interested in um, just to start. I mean, the, so the mist is based on a 1980 Steve, a short story by Stephen King. Um, there's going to be spoilers in this as well. I'm say that because I'm going to jump straight to saying that Stephen King said. So the original mist story ended with them um, just saying, "Let's see how far we can get," and just carry on driving, mm-hmm. and the story just ended. Frank Darabont doesn't do that. Mm-hmm. He goes an extra mile. And uh, literally, and um, Stephen King said he thought it was an improvement, and he thought the end of the film was great, and he wished he'd have thought of it. That's awesome when that <laughs> happens. Yeah, yeah, which is kind of great, you know. But I'm a big Stephen King fan. I just finished reading a Stephen King a couple of weeks ago. Um, big hit and miss, you know. Right with adaptions to film, mm-hmm. you know. There's there's some great stuff out there, but. You know, even now, I'm back. Back when the mess came out, Frank Darabont was the guy to go to mm-hmm. if you didn't want your Stephen King messed up because he'd already done Shawshank and mm-hmm. The Green Mile. Um, but yeah, I'm just very interested in what you thought of the end, but the whole thing. Actually. Sure, sure. So first of all, when I put in the the DVD, Blu-ray, whatever we it's watched, not a date movie. Um, it's not no, date movie. but I, I I thought that there were two just like there's two fogs i thought there were two the mists oh and i thought you brought the remake unwittingly okay and then like to, we got about two minutes into it well once i realized it was stephen king thing i was like oh okay there must be just this version yeah um i remember when the movie was being advertised and kind of wanting to go see it because marcia gay harden was in it and i was like well you know mm. if they got marcia gay harden it's probably going to be better than b movie yeah. status right she yeah. really until she did 50 shades she was doing quality movies. She that, oh dear. yeah uh, <laughs> yeah she plays the mother of the main dude um yeah and it, it killed me to know no Mar- yeah no marcia gay harden is now playing <laughs> the mother of adults but um nice paycheck yeah um but yeah she uh <coughs> 
so anyway, I was kind of interested never got around to it. I think I got it confused, honestly, with the Fog remake at yeah. some point. Yeah, we don't do that. Because it's the, mist, <laughs> the Fog. I hadn't seen either. Didn't you know? Wasn't all that interested in, in, in yeah. either that much. Well, this never got particularly advertised. And I remember I, I saw it at the theater. I saw Alamo Village, I think, when it came out. And... I dragged my. I enjoyed it so much. I dragged my brother to see it. I think in the same week, so I saw it twice in a week. Mm-hmm. And then after that, I remember I've spent the last ten years basically saying to even knowledgeable people like you, you know, have you seen The Mist? And they either go, I don't know what that is, or they go, I've heard that's good, but I've never watched it. Yeah. So. Yeah, I don't know how well it did. The thing that they failed to do with the advertising is they basically tried to sell it as a Thomas Jane movie, mm. is my recollection, <laughs> with, with Marsha Gay Harden in it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I like Thomas Jane. He's he's yeah. he's a great actor, but... He's great in this. He, yeah, yeah, but he was not carrying movies. The thing that's crazy about this movie is they should have sold it as what it was. It was yeah. this ensemble movie yeah. that had lots of people you do know. Um if you like Walking Dead, which has all these different characters, and it's it's more about how they interact as something's going on mm-hmm. around them that they can't control. Before these actors, actresses went on to The Walking Dead, because of course Frank Darabont started that off as well. Right. Um, so it's it's really similar in, in, as far as that goes, um, but it's got this cast that includes Andre Brower, yeah. which if you were uh, in the US in the mid 90s and you didn't watch Homicide Life on the Streets I'm sorry <laughs> you should have go watch it now um, it, it has Toby Jones it, uh, Lori Holden best who, character Toby Jones oh Toby Jones is fantastic it's got yeah. William Sadler um, Jeffrey DeMann yeah, right. yeah I'm yeah. just I'm for, for, it, it's so full of people you know yeah <laughs> that yeah. it's mind boggling that this is not how the movie was sold I love the guy who plays the biker with a big knife mm-hmm. who goes off with the rope wrapped around his waist. Mm-hmm. So originally, Frank Darabond wanted Stephen King to have a little cameo and play that role. <laughs> and Stephen King was just like, I live too far away, I can't be bothered to fly. I'm, I like Stephen King, and he's great mm-hmm. in It Chapter 2. He has a little cameo in that as a shop owner. Mm-hmm. But I'm kind of glad he didn't play that character because this is played very, very straight. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, just having him there would have knocked that off a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. If they'd gotten him as to be like the first guy killed, yeah. it would have been probably fine. But anything yeah. after that. It's it's um I, I actually wrote a, a post about um Night of the Creeps mm. yesterday. Uh I and it, I said horror movies either I'm... have to be really fun for me, like Night of the Creeps, yeah, or they have to have something to bite into to say. Yeah. Um, and this movie... It's to chew on. Right. And this movie is really about how people react in a crisis situation. Well, Frank Darabon himself said... I'm going I'm to read you his quote that I dug up yesterday. Um, it's not the monsters outside, but those inside. Your friends and neighbors breaking down under strain mm-hmm. that you have to worry about. So, um, I have been... <laughs> into situations at work where something very bad happened. Uh, one of them was an active shooter situation in the library I worked in. Fortunately, I was not in the library that day. Mm. I happened to be heading to another library in another city. I was on the road, but I hadn't quite left yet. So I was on the phone trying to call my coworkers to make sure they were safe, that sort of thing. Yeah. And the way people reacted to the fact someone had a machine gun running around the library Terrifying. was insane. Oh yeah. Uh, I had a guy in my team who <coughs> decided Tech one. he was very <laughs> irritated that people were telling him what to do and they told him he had to clear the building, so he went and sat in the plaza in front of the library on a bench. <laughs> yeah. On his phone. Just playing <laughs> games. Okay. And I was like Man, you, you really... I'm on the phone with him, like, yelling at him. Like, you need to get across the street and get inside another building. Totally. The SWAT team is coming, and they will kill you. Yeah. Like, and he's just... I don't I don't like the fact that people are telling me what to do. I, I, I <laughs> And you're just like, that's like crazy. De- that's like denial, doesn't it? Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. People just... Re- and, and another time... Um, after this, they set up all these protocols, and we all have... Get text messages and all of this, in case anything happens on campus. Um... And I was kind of joking about it because it happened so often that we'd get these alerts. And then it was like, oh, something actually happened. And it happened right outside of the library. Yeah. And I was like, oh, my God. So I jumped up 
and was like, we gotta, we gotta make sure that doors between us and the outside world, we hit, we were in this kind of area. We kept these sliding doors open all day, closed them at five, locked them up. Yeah. I run out there and everyone knows what the protocol is. If there's another active shooter situation, it's to come back into behind these other wooden doors that are like 20 minute fire doors and be back in that area. And mm-hmm. I go out there, everyone's gotten the message. They're all still just working away. <sighs> totally yeah. in denial. And I was like, guys, I don't know exactly what's going on, but someone was really, really hurt outside the library. Like, yeah. You guys got a corral and you have to get back there. And the librarian's like, I just I just need to finish this. And you're like, no, yeah. we, we actually have to. There's an emergency going on. You yeah. need to pull and you need to get out of here away from the class. Yeah. So eventually kind of round everybody up and kind of corral them back. And we then you turn around. Like Gary Oldman and Leon, we like who has to leave everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I am trying to like lock the door and uh, meanwhile another one of my managers not from my team from another team walks past me yeah. and he's heading out I'm like where are you going we're in a lockdown situation he's like I've got a meeting up on four I was like we're in lockdown you're supposed to be in your office with the lights off yeah yeah and he's like Pfft. and I, just keeps going I will and I was say like, you have a team you're responsible for and yeah. you just walked away from him I will say, working at a school as I do, uh-huh. I think we take that slightly. We take that more seriously. I was going to say slightly more seriously, but a lot more seriously. There is no reason in the world anyone in Texas, after we had an active shooter like eight years before, and we're the same place that had the tower shootings, yeah. shouldn't be taking all this totally seriously. And it I- was astounding to see the exact same people who'd been there for the prior shooting. To out- a guy got killed outside of the library. He was stabbed in the throat. Well, I think that just shows that, you know, adults especially, you know, when they're not in a kind of like a situation with children, mm-hmm. um, are like almost like a mixture of it's not going to happen to me or I'm above this mm-hmm. or almost like, you know, almost like how dare they yeah. interrupt my day. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, well, they will. And, you know, and to be honest, we, we've seen this in films. We've seen this in Die Hard uh-huh. with, you know, Ellis thinking he can negotiate and stuff. Yeah. So... Yeah. You know. I mean, it's it's this movie takes it way past. Obviously, we had our situation; it was over within like two hours, three hours. Mm. Um, but um, did you think the situation? Because watching again today, mm-hmm. I was thinking, especially the religious connotations. Mm-hmm. I was thinking it's heavy-handed, and it's obviously I can see, you know, right-wing people. Mm-hmm taking offense to this and saying that would never happen and this is you know very liberal view but at the same time i still personally kind of believed most of this i was like that probably would go down that way i i fully believe it would go down this way because we have evidence that shows it happens again and again and again and we have people who are right now to record this uh in in mid-october you know, we have uh, the the re- recordings from the past couple of weeks of Bill Barr, who's um, the, the uh, attorney general, I believe, but mm. standing up and, and saying exactly lines that Marsha Gay Harden's character says about, <laughs> you know, they mock us for our piety. Hell they yeah. mock, you know, it's, it, they're the ones who are bringing society down there and we're going to, you know, lock them down. We're going to we're going to take care of this. We're How to be yeah i mean it's there's a lot of truth to what happens in in best 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 line i thought was um i don't know who says it. i think it might be jeffrey demand where he kind of said you know and obviously this you know you can kind of plaster this onto you know what was happening in american politics at the time with bush but you know he kind of says if you frighten the population enough they'll believe anything they'll do anything and, well, I mean, that's what I was going to say next is after nine yeah. eleven, the country fundamentally changed. Yeah. There's absolutely no question. And this is definitely in 2007 still being affected by that, mm-hmm. I think, when this yeah. was made. Yeah, it hadn't quite baked into the culture then the way it has now, or we just kind of go, oh, that's the way things are now. Yeah. But the, the way people thought of security, the way people, I mean, we went from being able to you walk into an airport and walk up to any gate yeah. at any point you wanted to oh, yeah. to guys walking around with M16s in the, in the airport 
and yeah, I wasn't comfortable with it, but it was like, what are you going to do? Everyone's totally freaked out. Yeah. And they've told people, you know, to this day, we're still taking our shoes off when we go through yeah. security and they're, you know, they're paying someone, you know, minimum wage to watch them do it. And we're, we're totally willing to stand there and put our hands up and get x-rayed as we go through. Absolutely. None of it makes any sense. It's not going to stop anyone who's got a brain in their head who's at all motivated. But this yeah. is the kind of stuff that I think the mist was really fascinating in. You know, they got into the yeah. more the religious aspect, but the well, the, King's always been like Stephen King has yeah. always been. I don't want to say anti-religious, but anti a certain believer of mm-hmm. religion. Or I'm, I'm going to go to fanatics, anti-fanatic, mm-hmm. you know, religious fanatics, and he's also kind of always in you know his supernatural stories there's always been like a villain a very human villain Mm -hmm. who you know has kind of seen what's been going on and has kind of you know ridden the coattails of it to to their own ends so you know so that's very much Frank Darabong you know taking you know King straight off the page really yeah yeah Yeah. Um, and I mean they they invoke Jim Jones um, and I I think that that's not incorrect I mean you had you do have people who blood sacrifices yeah start turning you know turning to these people and um, once you kind of get the the that look in your eye and that's that's where you're heading it, it can be some spooky stuff um I like how the William Sadler character um <clears throat> obviously made a mistake towards the start mm-hmm. you know with letting the young you know kind of boy go out and mm-hmm. investigate and uh <coughs> excuse me by the way I'm kind of getting over a bit of sickness so apologies for the coughs um but then you know but then he almost becomes a team player you know he's very kind of like yeah. you know apologetic about that and then, of course, he just snaps later on due to too many horrible experiences and, and joins her, her clan. Yeah. 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 It, it's interesting. I think they say he passes, uh, uh, Thomas Jane's character passes out for just like a few hours and when he wakes up. There's this like tent revival going on in the middle of the grocery store. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, they do have this whole conversation of, you know, Laurie Holden's character saying, oh, people aren't really going to be like that. People are innately good. And they kind of go around the room and everyone else is like, are they? <laughs> We're about to find out. So I do love that scene because it is it is kind of like funny in the fact that, you know, Laurie Holden's hanging on to that hope. And everybody else is like, well, actually. <laughs> and then Toby Jones is like, put two of us in a room or more than two of us in a room. And two of them will gang up and try to kill the other. <laughs> I mean, I will say, I, for good or ill, um, that scene was like four men telling that to a single woman who was in the room. Um, Which probably would be different these days if yeah. they saw that now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if they did that intentionally or, or, you know, that happened to be the characters the way that they... I don't know how they are in the novella. I don't know how all of that works. I also, to give it a bit of a bit of credit I also was thinking well she's a, a school teacher right at an elementary school it came from a place yeah they weren't just having her say it because she was a woman yeah. so she's gonna be more optimistic hopefully yeah. than you know somebody else out in the real world you know yeah <laughs> yeah um but I, I you know it, it is not a quick pick me up you know fun <laughs> movie it, it's a kind of a weird downbeat way to end the the halloween viewings because i try and think of halloween as being it's horror but it's we're all having a good time and this is halloween this yeah is halloween. and this is not that yeah. uh i Thomas definitely James like go shoot everybody and shoot himself <laughs> Yeah. I will say when they the car ran out of fuel, I'm always, you know, when I would watch like Walking Dead or I watched, you know, movies, you go, well, what would I do in this situation? Yeah. And what I said to myself in my head was, you do absolutely do not immediately start shooting everyone in the head at this moment. I was like, yeah. this is the moment where you wait until something's on top of the car. Yeah. Yeah. It was like, because the minute you do. He did hear noises, though. <laughs> there was something pretty close. Right. Yeah. I was like, but I, I'd want. Yeah. visual confirmation before and I th- well I think it also goes back to you know he's obviously been through this experience for two days and yeah. seeing seen what's left of his wife and stuff it is not a bad decision the character makes well it's also the promise he made to his son originally yeah. back in the store was I'm not going to let the monsters get you yeah. I'm not going to let them eat you yeah. um, and I think he's thinking of that I'm really glad they didn't go with I'm thinking about this a little bit because I also want to get out this weekend um, of Get Out has the original ending, which you can see honestly on Amazon streaming. Mm-hmm. Or so Get Out when you saw it in the theater ended with like is, this, is this, mate this, turning up. 
uh, his mate turning up and, yeah. and kind of this he he was this hero and he drives away and you're like well they burned everything no one would have known he was there no one's gonna like go looking for him so mm. um, it is it is what it is um, but there was an original ending shot where that police car that pulls up is actually the police mm. and the shooting or something well he goes to prison for the rest of his life uh-huh. and maybe I don't know if he was going to be executed or not but yeah. it's conversation then between the two friends like between plate glass uh, is the actual ending of the movie that's cool that's not not as ballsy as I kind of hoped it would be because I was thinking they'd shoot it kind of Night of the Living Dead that would shoot him for apparently killing a white woman, maybe. Well, I mean, they're arresting him. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and and I, I think it's the same thing. Now he's got to live with everything that happened. Now his... his this The thing that Jordan Peele's voice, had a voiceover over the thing I saw yeah. him streaming, and he was yeah, saying um, he's actually okay with being in prison because he knows he did the right thing and he can, he, well he can live with himself right yeah. it, it's it's he's he's done everything he could have done in that moment yeah um, and he's telling his friend to quit trying to fight for him in court and all that at this point he's like it's just pointless they, from yeah. their evidence what I did this is what I did and yeah. yeah it was you know huge commentary all of which at the time of the release of the movie he uh, he said well I, I kind of went back and thought in the current climate we actually need someone who can yeah. you know survive a survivor story instead yeah um, and he which, hasn't really done anything wrong either so he kind of deserves to get away really it's like yeah I mean I, I, I don't have any problem in, in horror in particular with the ending being like this ending yeah I love um, this ending yeah. because and, and I know it, it pissed off a lot of people when it came out um, not, not necessarily critics but I think audiences yeah. um, because I can see you know, you run in the mill mainstream audience going to see this. <laughs> kind of walking out the like, oh, <laughs> uh, you know, that's, that's kind of spoiled my night um, a little bit. But yeah, I mean, it's it's, it's, horror. It, it, it's horror. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know? it's it's a cheap trick to at the end to go. You know what? Everything's going to be fine. It's actually. all a dream. Yeah, <laughs> you know, he, he's going to go off. He managed to learn <coughs> Lori Holden. Yeah. through this she already loves the kid they're gonna ha- now go off and, and Mammy and Pappy sitting in the back seat are gonna <laughs> you know go live with them in some house in the country like you know that was the thing with you know I Am Legend when they, they changed the ending of that as well so he like they, they yeah. drive off safely and it's like that's not how that's we've already had Omega Man we know this is yeah. not how things end well the famous one was Brazil wasn't it where Terry Gilliam fought Universal and you can get that on the DVD and Blu-ray the, the happily ever after ending whereas his one was like Jonathan Price has actually had a breakdown and he's just kind of like imagining the ending that mm-hmm. happy ending and then it switches back to him still being tortured and they're like I think we've lost him sir he's gone <laughs> and he's just like staring vacantly yeah. into space yeah um, I, I think there's there's something to those endings he gives you something more even if it's not you know I can now forget about this movie it, it gives more weight to the narrative they're trying to, to have for you mm. um, it it I don't want to be one of these people who's like, unless it's like dark and seedy, there you, there's no story there. No. But I don't think that you need to always give people an easy out. And I, I think it was a, a bold choice. I mean, I love, I mean, I love both, but I, I, I do like it when a director or writer or both have the balls to kind of have an ending like this mm-hmm. or The Thing mm-hmm. or American Werewolf or The mm-hmm. Fly, where it's just like, nope, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it didn't go well. Yeah. It's you know when the way you thought it should do, um, yeah. and, I mean, that, and that's back to the roots of horror. I mean, we're talking about yeah. American Werewolf. Um, then you're talking about how do things end for Frankenstein, Bride of Frankenstein, Wolfman, yeah. Invisible Man, which we watched the other night. Totally, it's like you're not getting happy endings at the end of those movies because yeah. some a line's been crossed. They may still find a way of bringing you back, but <laughs> at least until then, it's like you're dead. Um, I mean, we kind of forget as well that Frank Darabont had had a kind of history in horror. Um, so way before he did Shawshank, um, he wrote and worked on The 88 Blob. Mm. Um, and also The Fly 2. He he kind of like, he did like a lot of rewrites on that. Um, Nightmare on Elm Street 3 as well. And actually, you're probably already noticing if you're a horror fan that these are all kind of like, kind of cut above the average Mm-hmm. either episodes of the franchise or horror films in general you know they kind of tend to be you know top tier compared to what else was going on he also did a a draft of the Rocketeer and 
this is where you're going to find the most exciting he wrote a draft for Commando sequel that was never made <laughs> oh wouldn't that have been great <laughs> it probably would have been like taken he probably would have been retired yeah. wearing a suit and it would have been like oh where's my daughter let's kill everybody um <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah but no he kind of you know Frank Darabont himself said he wanted like something like Lord of the Flies kind of feeling or mm-hmm. Lifeboat mm-hmm. Alfred Hitchcock's Lifeboat um, he also purposely I think he had worked on The Shield and directed a couple of episodes of that and he purposely asked that crew to come and work on this not just for budgetary reasons but because he wanted a slightly gritty you know less um shiny sophisticated look to this Mm -hmm. a little bit more kind of like documentary style um in fact i've never i've never actually watched it i should um i should try this but i know on the dvd um when it came out they had two versions and they had a black and white version which frank dabon said was his preferred way of watching this Mm -hmm. because he said it kind of hides the joins a little bit more on the creatures Mm -hmm. and also it makes it like even more Mm otherworldly almost like a kind of he said almost like a 50s sci-fi movie sure yeah um what do you think about the effects by the way i thought they held up pretty well yeah for the era that when they came out um i think they knew what would work and what didn't they weren't trying to like put fur on things which helped um yeah and this cost 18 million by the way and it made 57 actually but that's worldwide so it only made 25 million in the states oh, so that's why no one's yeah yeah so only really clawed back his budget yeah yeah um that's interesting that it did that well overseas actually but yeah i can i can see it kind of been embraced more in Europe I was saying so. I can see Japan being like yeah <laughs> this is great tentacles um, yeah yeah but it's good to do it actually sure uh, <laughs> yeah it's it's uh, you said also that they were were doing a TV show of The Mist did you yeah read so about I, I, I know very little about this but I got excited and I read a couple of views and stopped being excited um because they said we made a TV show The Mist I think they've done two seasons now oh my god there's so much stuff out there that's amazing there could be a TV show about something like this you never even hear about it well I think I was telling you Frank Darabon was supposed to do a TV show The Thing Uh around this time you know mid 2000s as well which fell by the wayside I'm like that would have been great probably Um, so much better than the, the remake we got but um, but yeah, this Mist show. So I, I was like, oh my god, you know that's great. They can expand on this concept. That sounds amazing. They can have different characters having different experiences. And then I re- read a couple of reviews, and they pretty much said um, <clears throat> people imagine horrors, and they kind of come to life, and they're all kind of in one environment. And and I'm like, this kind of doesn't sound very good. And and pretty much everybody was like, it's not as good as the film. It doesn't do much with the concept. You know, and I was just like, maybe I won't watch that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is a real shame. Well, the movie still exists. The movie still exists. Um, um, but yeah, I, I would, I would highly recommend this one. Uh, but you mm-hmm. know, maybe not for Halloween. Even uh, maybe just another time when you're you're looking to watch something a little more challenging. Get depressed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, I. I, I I'm going to be an evangelist for it. I think um, yeah. it's it, it's it's something that we need more of. I think in it's American really horror, in, in having a cast that good, yeah, um, you know, it, it's amazing the difference having a good cast in a horror movie makes. Uh, I mean, I have actors that I like who are in horror movies, but I'm well aware, like they're a oh, yeah. B movie, yeah, you know, actor. I enjoy them in this context, yeah. um, but. Well, I think, I think it's also, you know, like we watched Nice of the Creeps the other night because mm-hmm. uh, I don't think we mentioned Tom Atkins enough in this podcast. <laughs> um, but he's, he sacrificed himself at the end of that. Uh-huh. But then they kind of have a joke where, you know, his corpse is still walking around. Yeah. And I'm like, that kind of undercuts any horror suspense you kind of had. Yeah. It kind of annoyed me a little bit. Although, you know, I know what it is. Mm-hmm. And I know what they're going for. Whereas actually watching this today with you, even though I've seen this, you know, mm-hmm. several times, and I actually watched over the summer, you know, as a Terror Tuesday, <clears throat> I found myself kind of getting on edge mm-hmm. and feeling a bit uncomfortable. And I'm like, isn't that so rare these days that you kind of get that from a horror film? Yeah. Um, 
you know, which, which I think is to be applauded, you know. Plus, you know, you've got good ideas going on there. You've got great acting. Mm-hmm. You've got very good effects. Um, there's not much of a score, but what there is, and they use uh, Dead Can Dance at the end, mm-hmm. um, you know, it almost has like a choir at the end. Very effective use of music. Um, I, I would recommend this as a Halloween film. I just... I think you got to know what you're getting into <laughs> when you watch it. Don't stick on for the kids. Right. And maybe, you know, don't do it as a date movie. But if you want to see a genuinely horrifying film for various reasons, yeah. watch it. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's a perfect place to wrap it up for this and for this Halloween season. Are we going to go, ooh, again? Uh, we, we can. <laughs> uh, I do have a question I asked Marshall when we did uh, Poltergeist. Do you believe in ghosts, Simon? Do I believe in ghosts? I should do. She might be in English, but I, I don't. I don't. I did have a Ghostbusters T-shirt as a child, and I would have another one now in a shop. Um, I love ghost stories, but I, I have never seen any evidence. I will, I will go this far though. I will say that I think you can go to certain environments or walk into certain places, and the energy can be very positive or negative. Um, possibly as an echo of what's happened there Mm -hmm. I wouldn't go so far as you know cups flying around or uh, you know anything like that but I do think you can go into a certain place and it's like I don't want to be here this doesn't feel good this feels kind of bad or negative on some level Mm -hmm. Um, that's as far as I'm going to go I think at the moment but I'm open I have an open mind I'm no Dan Aykroyd but I have an open mind (laughs) fair enough (laughs) I've got to ask this like all year long to everyone who comes in to do a podcast. Do you believe yeah. in ghosts? Whether well, yeah. we're, we're watching something totally different. I believe in Tom Atkins. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll end there. <laughs> Happy Halloween, everybody. And if you will. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Let's try not to cough. <laughs> oh, dear. That's pretty good. That's good. it up for this edition of the signal watch a production of the league of melbotis thanks for sticking with us if you enjoyed this podcast we invite you to drop on by the signal watch blog where you'll find write-ups of a wide variety of movies and more you can drop comments on this podcast and let us know what you think we do have a signal watch patreon and if you're so moved we'd most certainly appreciate your support We'll be back soon with more exceedingly high-quality content. So, until next time. God damn it, babies. You've got to be kind. <laughs>